And if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter 1. And we're going to be in verses 15 through 23. So Ephesians 1, 15 through 23. As you're turning there, um, when you hear the sentence or a conversation start off with, uh, did you hear about so-and-so? Did you hear about Nick? Did you hear about, usually those conversations don't end up going too well, right? It's usually not a very positive and uplifting conversation that comes from that. And you can, you can turn it the other way sometimes. Oh, did you hear about so-and-so? They got married or they did this or something good. But generally when we hear that, it's not a good thing that happens. So, uh, but tonight we're going to look at how Paul hears about the church in Ephesus. And then we're going to look at his response to what he heard. So we're going to uh, start in Ephesians chapter 1. 15 through 23. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom, revelation, in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of the calling? What are the riches of the glory of the inheritance of, in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated in him at the right hand of the heavenly places, far above principalities and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Heavenly Father, uh, God, as we look through your word tonight, Lord, we pray that you would be our teacher. Lord, we pray that um, you would speak directly to our hearts, whatever it is you want us to hear. Lord, I pray that, that as, uh, as we hear your word, as we hear these thoughts, Lord, that we would immediately put them into application in our own lives. Lord, we love you. We pray your spirit just be on this place. In your name we pray. Amen. Um, so we see we start off in, um, in verse 15. He starts off with therefore, and that's a connecting thought. So I want to kind of sum up what Paul has been saying to the church of, of Ephesus, what he's been saying to them in uh, verses 1 through 14. And Paul points out things that are true of you because you are a believer. So things that are true of you because you're a believer. And these are the things that summed up is what he says. You are chosen before the foundation of the world, adopted into his family. We are redeemed through the blood. Your sins have been forgiven. We have the promise of heaven, and you, are, and you have the Holy Spirit in you. So that's what he kind of sums up in verses 1 through 14. Anybody want to read that one? That sounds like good stuff, doesn't it? You can go home and read that, and you're like, ah, oh, it's going to be really good, I promise. So uh, we pick up in, in verse 15. Therefore, I also, after I've heard your faith in the Lord Jesus and the love you have for all the saints. Paul points out two characteristics of an authentic church here, two characteristics of a very authentic church. And they're pretty, they're pretty tangible. We can, we can wrap our heads around these faith in the Lord and love for all his people. So faith in the Lord and love for all of his people. And it's kind of a, a silly question, but you know, can a church building do that? Can a church building be uh, love for everybody? Can it have that faith? Obviously not. Obviously he's talking to us believers. He's talking to the, the believers there in Ephesus. So he's talking to us and he says, you know, um, uh, he says, Paul is addressing the people, which means he's addressing us. What are you known for? What are you known for? That thought has just kind of been hit in my head ever since we've been studying this. As an ambassador of God first, and, and kind of as a congregation here, we're an ambassador of God to, to Vero Beach of Calvary Chapel, right? We're out there and we're living. Um, are people hearing about your faith and your love? Are people in the community hearing about your faith 
and your love? At work, do they know about your faith? When you're at, your, at the gym, do they know about your faith? I mean, it, your, does your family know about your faith and your love that you have for the church? I think it's interesting that Paul's far off and he hears about this. And I think about family and I have family all over the country. And so it's like, does my family know about my faith? And the Lord, does he know about the love? Do they know about the love that I have for the church and all the saints? It's funny that word, all the saints there. Um, I kind of had to pray through this one too, that even the ones that sometimes, you know, we don't get along with the best here at church, or maybe it's the ones that we are not, uh, we don't have the most in common with. Paul puts that all in there the love for all the saints here at the church. And that's for us here, man. We have to, we have to see everybody here that's, um, that's a, a follower of Jesus Christ, man. We have to show love to all of them, to everybody, and to be that unified body. So when the world sees us, they say, wow, that's a Christian. That's, that's a believer. Um, so let's look at what Paul prays for, for the church and what he prays for, for us. Verses 16 and 17, you can look down with me and read. Do not, he says, so I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. When we read that, that word wisdom, you know, it's not talking about earthly wisdom that we gain from, uh, from street smarts. It's not something, that wisdom isn't something that we gain from experiences, from things like that, or, or books that we read. This wisdom isn't talking about that. Same thing with the revelation. He's not talking about, you know, seeing into others' lives or being able, being able to uh, predict events that are coming up. This wisdom and this revelation he says, he prays that they would be led deeper and deeper into the knowledge of the eternal truths about God. So this wisdom and this revelation that he's praying for the, the church here and for us isn't wisdom for earth things. It's not here for that. It's for the knowledge and the things of God. So he's praying for us to get into a deeper and a deeper knowledge and wisdom of who God is, of the thoughts of God, of what God has a passion for. That's what he wants us to focus on. And that's his kind of prayer uh, to the Ephesians here. Paul prays that their relationship with the Lord would be ever digging deeper. I think about the, in 1 Corinthians, when it talks uh, about moving from milk to meat, right? Um, for those of you who don't know, I have a little son named Remy, and I uh, love him. He's nine months old, and so the last couple months, he's been starting to move off of milk and starting, well, not off of it, but we started adding things in, like, have you seen those, uh, those applesauce packets, the little twi twist lid on there? It's awesome because there's not a lot of dishes, so uh, we've been giving him those, and they're great on the go, and he, so he's got applesauce. And then he's moving to like sweet peas and it's all mushed up and, you know, disgusting looking, but he's loving it, right? He's moving on. And just last week we started giving him these things. They're like little cracker wafers. And when you bite them, they dissolve. Y'all know what, any parents know what I'm talking about? All right, good, two of us. So uh, you bite it and it dissolves. So it's safe for kids, but it's funny because he's never experienced texture like something hard that he had to chew. He's never experienced that. So he's got like six little teeth and he takes a bite and he's like, what well, is in my mouth? And then it's dissolved and gone. You know what I mean? So he's, he's kind of figuring this thing out like, this is crazy. This is a new experience, but he's moving from milk um, on to, to better and bigger things. Tomorrow night we're doing uh, filet mignon. So we're excited about it. Um, <laughs> So, uh, but, but it's that idea of moving from milk to meat, getting more and more mature, deeper into our, our relationship with the Lord. I know we have some uh, Dodger fans in the house. So yeah, the whole front row and one in the back. Got it. Uh, so right now, if you don't follow baseball, they're in, a, um, in the World Series with the Houston Astros. And uh, one of the Dodgers' uh, number one pitcher, their ace, is named Clayton Kershaw. I can't believe I'm mentioning his name on stage right now, but <clears throat> Clayton Kershaw, I, I bet if I pulled this front row just right here, we could get stats on stats of Clayton Kershaw from his rookie year, like the first year till right now, you could get his ERA, you could get his batting average, you could get you anything you want, you could get from this front row right now, I promise you that. But if we were to get a little bit deeper, I'd say, hey, what's, what's his favorite dessert? You know, what's his, what's his relationship like with his parents? 
You know, what's, what is one of his biggest fears? Do you see the difference? It's like we can know some things about him, but, but it's got to be something deeper. If you know any of those three, like y'all need help. So, so don't, I hope you guys don't know that. But it's, it's talking about it, that idea of getting deeper, not just surface knowledge, not just, you know, kind of knowing God is, but he's encouraging to dive deeper into the word and dive deeper into the relationship with the Lord where he can teach them new things. A quick side note, uh, a lot of people in the world ask these kind of questions and they're like, you know, why am I here? What's my purpose? Who am I? And those people spend countless hours um, trying to find the answers to that. They, they dive into countless different self-help books and read and see different things online on, on how they can get better. They can figure out who they are, figure out what their purpose is in life. And I'm convinced that if they spent just a little time reading the word of God, diving into the word of God and just praying the, a simple prayer, hey God, are you real? Hey God, would you reveal something to me? If you're, if you're real like these people I see that are walking around saying they're believers, like if you're real, would you show that to me? I'm convinced that if they did that, God would reveal himself to them, that he would, he would reach out to them, that, um, that they would find if they read in the scripture and they dug just a little bit, or maybe us as believers, we're showing our faith and we're talking to them, um, they'd find their identity, they'd find their purpose in this world. They'd find uh, that, God who, uh, that God knew them before they were even born, before they were in their mother's womb, that he knew who they were gonna be, he knew their personality, he knew all that even before he was, they were born. They would find that God loves them more than anyone else on this planet, including themselves. And they'd find that they are called children of the living God, adopted into an eternal family. They'd find these truths that would answer all those questions, right? Just, that, just by diving in the word, just by, by searching and just asking God simple questions, God does that. And uh, that's what a non-believer finds when he digs a little bit, right? If a non-believer digs in the word just a little bit, and ask the Lord just a little bit, he reveals those things to him. But we see here that, um, that Paul, he's talking to believers. And he says, um, he says that if we, see, if we search deeper, if we're seeking those deeper thoughts, the revelation from the Lord, if we're seeking the wisdom of the things of God, he's gonna reveal those to us. Digging deeper in our relationship with God and our knowledge of him is essential for us as believers. So we don't get stuck. We don't get stale. We don't get to that point where we're like, yeah, I've heard this Bible study before. I'm gonna tune out. Or yeah, I've, I've been there. I've done that study. I'm not gonna go this time or, or whatever it is. It, it's, it's, it's about building and getting deeper in our relationship with the Lord. And what does that look like? I know it's kind of simple, maybe a little elementary, but think about, I think the first thing that I think about when I wanna get deeper with the Lord is his word. And I've, I've broken down like kind of three different things, a personal time with the Lord. Do you have personal time at the, at, with, with the Lord at home where you read scripture just to read scripture and ask him to reveal himself to you? That's one of the biggest times where God's gonna pour into you is having that personal time that you dig into the word with the Lord. And you can have that too by, by digging into scripture with uh, like a small group. We have a lot of small groups, connect groups here at Calvary Chapel, a little plug in for you. If you wanna get involved, we have a bunch of those. See the Get Connected booth afterwards. But, um, or maybe it's just one-on-one, -on -one, a good friend. Maybe it's your, your husband or your wife and you guys, you guys dig in the word together. That's how we get deeper and deeper into the thoughts of God and what God is gonna to reveal to us through his spirit. Uh, maybe it's even bigger. Maybe you're just here on Saturday nights. That's a great way to dive into the word. We've already read a little bit, so you can check it, right? We're, we're, we're diving into the word right now. And these are, these are three different ways that we can continue to get deeper. And uh, the other thing that I, that I pointed out, and it's pretty simple too, but it's prayer. And not just prayer that, you know, when something goes wrong and you fire that up to the Lord or it's right before we eat and the whole family's there, so you have to pray, you know, not, not that kind of stuff. I'm talking about like a real personal time that you spend with the Lord in prayer. Maybe you're, maybe you're asking God for something and it's, you're pleading with him, Lord, would you please? And, or maybe it's just a, a time of, man, you gotta air some stuff out. I, I've, there's been times in my life, probably two or three that I can count, but I, where I just cried before the Lord in prayer and I just gave to him what I had and what was on my heart. These are the types of ways that we can dig deeper and these are the ways that the Lord is gonna speak to us is when we open up and we say, God, reveal your true wisdom to us. Not wisdom of this world, but wisdom of you. And that's what Paul is just praying for um, 
for the, the church in Ephesus here. I was talking to um, a, a friend of mine who is uh, actually a doctor in town, and I was asking him, you know, after you, you know, graduated, after you took the test and you became a doctor, what were some of the requirements that, that happened for you? And he said, well, 20, he, he's required 24 hours of continuing education every year. So every year as a doctor, he has 24 hours of continuing education to learn more about his field, to things that happen that are new, new discoveries, new things that, that, that are coming up, or maybe it's just brushing up on some other stuff. But he has 24 hours. He said that turns out to like 10 to 15 different classes a year that he spends in his field digging into what God has called him. And so um, Paul kind of describes that, and I, I kind of see that as our relationship with the Lord too, right? We have to continue to dig deeper into our field. And Paul uh, refers to this as running the race. In uh, Philippians 3, 12 through 14, he says this, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may, hold, may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press forward the goal for the prize of the upward calling of God in Christ Jesus. He's telling us to dig deeper. He's pleading with, with us to dig deeper and let the Holy Spirit reveal new and incredible things to us. If you look in uh, verse 18 with me, it says, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. So that's how it kind of starts off. And the eyes of your understanding, or to kind of break it down, it's the eyes of our heart, All right? He's talking about our heart here, the inner me. Um, they've already been enlightened. These, the, the church of Ephesus, they've already been enlightened, right? They've already come into a saving relationship with the Lord. They've already understood, I need Jesus, Right? So the scales have fallen off. They are now, they're like believers in Jesus Christ. And he's saying, I want you guys to go deeper. I want you the, your eyes to be enlightened. And he's talking about the eyes of our heart. He's referring to that inner person, right? He's referring to that inner me, the one that is in our, our emotions, our will and our drive. That's what God's referring to. That's who he's talking to, our hearts. He's like, the eyes of our heart. And it's here that Paul prays, that we would have, and I call it better vision, all right? Uh, better vision regarding these things. So if we summed up the first part of 18, we're gonna talk about it. It's, he's asking for better vision, the eyes of our understanding be enlightened. So that's what I'll be saying here. The, uh, the Paul prays that we would have better vision in three things. The first thing is hope. There's three things that he prays for. The first thing that we'd have better vision in hope, we'd have better vision in riches, and we'd have better vision in power. And the first one we'll look at tonight is, is hope, better vision of the hope of his calling. For us as believers, the most secure truth we have is knowing that God has a specific calling on each one of our lives. Amen? That's incredible, right? That should be one of the most securing thoughts is that God has a very specific purpose for each and every single one of our lives. Uh, let's look at that word, that word hope for just a second. Um, hope in a worldly sense, I kind of broke it down into two. In a worldly sense, it's like uh, a good feeling of expectation that's coming, right? Or maybe you just, the hope, maybe like I wish, or I, I hope this, I wish this happened, a pipe dream. Or uh, if it was a month ago, it would have been, I hope the Cardinals make the playoffs, but that didn't happen. So it was like a hope. It was kind of like a 50-50 thing here. Um, maybe some of you guys in the morning are just saying you hope you don't get stuck at a train. Anybody? All right, yeah, that happens to come in between 8.30 and 9 when you're supposed to be at work. I don't get it, but um, yeah, you hope you don't get stuck at that train. At, at some point in my life, I was at the, um, at the grocery store, and I had the hope that my debit card would go through with all the stuff that was in my line, right? So it's kind of like that, I hope that this goes through. I hope that this happens. It's kind of like a 50-50 thought, but the hope in a biblical sense looks like this. God made a promise that something's going to happen and we put our trust in knowing that that's gonna go through. That's the hope, that we know that God made a promise and we don't hope, it's not a 50-50 thing. We know that God is gonna come through. He's gonna do what he says he's gonna do. We can have confidence in that. It's not an if, 
but it's a win. Um, an example of that is maybe you're in a moment of weakness and you cry out, you know, God, you promised no temptation has overtaken me except what is common to man, right? And you're, you're crying out to the Lord here. You're like, provide that way out. I know you said you're going to do that. We can have hope. We can trust that God's going to do it in that time. Maybe a, a, a moment or a feeling of being alone or abandoned. God, you promised that you would never leave me. You promised you wouldn't forsake me. We can have hope. We can trust and know that God's going to do that that he is gonna provide what he said. When he says something in his word, we can take it to the bank. We know that that is the truth. And so that's kind of like the biblical example. That's what I, I see here as hope. But let's see how Paul uses that word hope in here. Paul's asking for a deeper understanding or better vision of the hope of the calling in their lives, the hope of their calling. When I think of that, I think of the, um, the story of Abraham and I think of the covenant that, that God made with Abraham, right? And I think about, he said to him, he said, you'll, have, you'll be fathers to many nations and I will make you exceedingly fruitful and I will make nations of you and kings shall come from you. I don't know if you, about me, but I'm like, man, the dude was 99 years old, right? He was old and he's, he's given these awesome promises and it's like, all right, that's it. Lord, I'm gonna trust in you. I'm gonna put my hope in you and the Lord kept his promise, didn't he? With his son, Isaac, <coughs> excuse me. He kept his, his, his promise and he provided that son at a late age, his name was Isaac. And this is where I'm, I'm convinced, we know that kind of story, but this is where I'm convinced that Abraham had hope in God's calling on his life when God called him to sacrifice his son. God called him to sacrifice his one and only son that he had already promised. He's like, I'm gonna make nations through you. I'm gonna, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna have descendants all over the place. And, and he gives him this promise. And I can just, if it were me, I'm like, but, but God, this is my son. This is the one you kind of said was gonna, if it were me, I would have said, but God, but God, wait, but not Abraham, right? It even says the next day he got up. <laughs> so it didn't take him a week. It didn't take him a month to, to marinate on this. He was like, all right, God, you know, you did it. He understood the hope and the calling. He trusted in the Lord that he knew what he was doing. Um, we see it in, uh, uh, Paul wrote in Philippians chapter one, verses six, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's a good verse to, to highlight. That's a good one to keep in there, that God is going to continue what he started. And we take hope in that. We take hope in the fact that God, God's calling on our life is better. You know that? God's calling on our life is better than, than anything that we can even imagine. It's better than anything that the world can tell us that is going to be really, really awesome or really, really good. God's calling on our life is better, and I promise you that. It's, it's, it's incredible. Uh, and this is that hope that Paul's praying for, the hope that we can have confidence in the Lord. So that first one that we looked at is Paul asked for better vision on the hope of the calling in each one of our lives. The, the, um, the second one we're gonna look at is riches. So Paul prays for better vision of the riches of the glory of his inheritance. I believe the Bible describes the idea of inheritance and inheriting riches in two different ways. The first concept I can kind of understand, right? The first one I can, I can grasp, I can understand this is the riches I inherit from being adopted into the family of God, right? So, so the things that I inherit from God, so the, the things maybe we read at, at the very beginning that um, in Ephesians chapter one through 14, all those things we listed, those are some of the things that I inherit when I say, God, I surrender my life to you and I'm gonna follow after you. God gives us a lot of riches, right? There's a lot of really awesome and amazing stuff. Ephesians, if you look up Ephesians 1, 11, talks about this. In him also, we have obtained in an inheritance. Uh, Colossians 1.12 also says it's giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. So like that's that backs up. God wants to give us an inheritance and it's awesome. Some of that part of the inheritance that I jotted down was a vast fortune in heaven, right? He says you're storing up treasures in heaven. So that's one of the things. I think one of the craziest and one of the ones that I love the most is eternal life. 
That's what we get when we put our faith in Jesus Christ is we get to be with him for eternity. And that's for me the most important. I'm ready. I don't care if I live in a shack up there. I want to I want to be with God. I'm excited to, to be in heaven. Um, so uh, that was that one. I also did, uh, I, I put down forgiveness and then the fruits of the spirit. Do the fruits of the spirit come easy to anybody in here? All of them come easy? Because I'll read them real quick. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those come easy to everybody in here? Because without the Lord, I can get maybe one, and it's like half a one. You know what I mean? So for me, it's like, man, th these are the things that I inherit from God that I need in my life. And those are the things. So that's, that's the concept of inheriting riches that I can wrap my brain around. Uh, but the second concept of inheriting riches that he's, he's mentioning here that we would dive deeper in, that we would look into, is um, Paul wants us to see that we are God's riches. We're his possession, purchased by the blood of his son, Christ. Do you know that God put a very high value on each one of our lives? God put a huge value on each and every single one of our lives that accept him. And that was his son, Jesus. That's how much he loves us. I let that sink in and I'm like, wait a second, what? I'm valued that much by you. Psalm 33, 12 says this. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The people he has chosen has his own inheritance. Deuteronomy 32, 9 says this. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the place of his inheritance. And these just kind of back up what God's saying here and, and what I sometimes have a really hard time uh, putting my brain around that we are his inheritance. I feel like, you know, hey, God, you got the short end of this stick <laughs> because there's times like every single day that I know I fail you, that I don't give you 100% of what I'm supposed to be giving you. There's times that I don't do the things that I'm supposed to and I do the things that I'm not supposed to do, but yet you call me your riches? To me, that's, that's mind-blowing. It's crazy to me. Um, I, always, I don't always want to give him our best, but we are treasured by God. We are treasured by God, and uh, if, if you want proof of that, let's just look at the cross. Look at the cross and what he gave up for each and every single one of us. He calls us his riches. We are his inheritance, which if that doesn't humble you, I don't, I don't know what can, right? I, I was studying this, this text and I was getting into this and I, I was talking to Pastor Pete for a little while and I'm like, man, I spent, I spent like five or six hours on this one little part just thinking about, wow, that's how much God loves me. That's the price that, that's how he values, that's how much he values me, so... Just incredible kind of thought. I feel that this concept is part of that deeper knowing of God that Paul was referring to earlier when he, when he was encouraging us to dive in, to, to, to dig deeper into him. But either way we interpret the phrase, uh, whether it's receiving the inheritance or whether we are God's inheritance, there's only one application from that, and we have to live holy, set-apart lives for God. So no matter which way you think about that, we have to live holy and set-apart life for God. Um, the last thing that we're going to look at tonight is uh, Paul prays for better vision in the exceeding greatness of his power. The exceeding greatness of his power. Now, uh, if you think about it with me, the world can kind of look very chaotic right now, right? If you look at the news, if you read a newspaper still, you know, if you listen to the, uh, the radio in, on your way in to work, the world can seem really chaotic, can it? With political chaos and wars and violence and natural disasters showing up everywhere. Does anybody feel me on this one? Can the world sometimes just feel really, really chaotic? It can. And it's easy to forget sometimes. It's easy for us to get overwhelmed by all these things that we see, read, and hear about. And it's easy for us to forget that God's in control. That God didn't just make the world, create it, and just let it go and step back. And every once in a while, he'd, you know, dive in or he'd help out here. No, no, no. He is, he is holding on to the world, right? He is in everything, and he is in control. And think about, we're going to see the, the power of God here, but I think about the disciples when Jesus was arrested. 
right? They're in the garden and Jesus was arrested. Can you imagine what was going on in their hearts? A little bit of anxiety came up, right? And they're like, oh my goodness. And then all of a sudden he's arrested and he's taken away. He's put in jail. And then he's brought, brought before Pilate. And then you see it just got gradually getting worse and worse and worse for Jesus until he's sentenced and he's walking up to, the, to Golgotha and he's standing there and they, they put him on that cross. Can you imagine just the disciples, the anxiety, like, oh my gosh, it's just chaotic. Everything's going, but he had said, how is this going to happen? You know, all these things that had to have been going through their mind, I don't think that they were thinking too much of, you know what, God's in control. They didn't show up there like, guys, it's all right. Let it ha- it's okay. God's in control. He's got this. You know, that wasn't the thought of the disciples. In fact, Jesus predicted and said that they would scatter, right? They would scatter about. And so um, Paul uses the best example, I think, in the Bible to describe God's power in the rest of this passage. So let's read it. And I think it's, it's pretty obvious. It's pretty clear. It's the resurrection. The, mo- the biggest display of God's power that we can read in the Bible, I think, is the resurrection. Verse 19, you can pick up with me till the end in Ephesians. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the he- in heavenly places, far above principalities and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and he gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness and of him who fills all in all. I love this, uh, this kind of concept that he's talking about power. And he talks about the biggest power that we not only possess because we're, uh, we're um, children of God, but we see it right here. Death is something that everyone here born will face. I know that's not a huge revelation to everybody, but if you think about it, some, that's, that's something we're all going to have to face. And I think um, death is so final for humans, right? It's so final for us to think about that death is coming. It's going to happen to each and every one of us, but it's, it's kind of like that looming over your head thing that it's, it's the ultimate end, right? For, for humans, it's the ultimate ends for our body. But uh, one of the truths that I've really been hanging on to in this study is death submits to the Lord. Death submits to the Lord. The power of Christ's conquering death not only has physical power, but it has eternal power. Uh, one of the quotes I read from the, one of the commentaries that I was diving into was this. It says, this stupendous power changes us from children of hell to children of God and gives us practical victory over the sins in our life. I think we're going to have it up on the screen, but um, it's in Romans chapter 5. Or chapter six, I believe. Yeah, chapter six, five through ten, and uh, just just think about the resurrecting power. Think about what we've been talking about here, and how Paul's trying to get us to dive in deeper into the things of the Lord, to get in deeper, and to to ask for the wisdom and the revelation of the Lord. Let's let's read about it. Uh, Romans chapter six, verse five. For if we have been united together in the likeness of His death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of His resurrection knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once and for all. For the life that he lives, he lives in God. I love that verse. We see two uh, displays of his power and the resurrection that we can share in, right? So we see two ways. We see two uh, displays of God's mighty power, his holy power, and the resurrection that we as believers can share in. The first one is the freedom from the bondage of sin. I think for us, uh, that's uh, an, an amazing thing. We can be free from the bondage of sin. Now we're, you, you know, Jim, who's usually up here teaching, he does a great job of this. So we all know that that doesn't mean we're never going to sin anymore, correct? 
There's going to be times where we mess up. There's going to be times where we give in to our flesh. There's going to be times maybe on the way home when somebody cuts you off. You know, there's, there's going to be times that we are going to sin, but we're not going to be enslaved to that sin, that we're going to have the Holy Spirit that's going to convict our hearts, and we're like, oh, God, I saw that, Lord. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. I, I want to do what's right in front of you, and he's faithful, and he'll forgive us from those sins, right? So we're free from the bondage of sin. That's one of the powers that God gives us. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? That we're no longer enslaved to the, the ways, the sinful nature that's inside of us. And the second one is we share in his life. That's what we read here in Romans is we share in his life. Death no longer looms over our head. Death, it, you know, there's gonna be death to this mortal body, but guess what? We're gonna live with Christ one day. We're gonna stand before him. Or if you're me, I'm probably gonna be flat on my face before him one day. And so that's, that's something that we can share in that power of God. He talks about um, the resurrection uh, one more, one more uh, Bible verse from Romans chapter 8, 9 through 11 says this, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of the sin, but the spirit of life because of righteousness but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. That's the resurrecting power. That's the resurrecting power that God has that we inherited, that we get, that we get to live. And that's the, that's the spirit of God, the, the power of God that lives within us. I'm gonna point out one last thing and then um, I'm done. If you go back to um, our text in Ephesians, you'll see at the, the very end, or I'm sorry, in verse 20, um, where does Jesus say that he is? Where does, where does Paul say that Jesus is? He's seated, right? He's seated at God's right hand. And why is he seated? Why is he there? Why, why is he seated there? Why isn't, I, I just, you know, I wanted to kind of break this, this part down but uh, I was listening to one of Pastor Jim's sermons and uh, it really stuck out to me. He said, uh, because the work is done. He's seated there at God's right hand because the work is done. It's finished, it's official, it's been accomplished. Jesus bridged the gap between sin or between man and God that sin separated, right? Jesus, he, he bridged that gap. All we have to do is put faith in him and he bridged that gap. So he's seated now. He did the work. He put in the work. Jesus put in the work, and now all we have to do is believe and enjoy that. I think um, when I was a kid, I lived in St. Louis, and um, we had a pretty big backyard back there. And my, uh, my dad, my two uncles, and my grandfather decided they were going to build a, a big tree fort for us in the back. And it was, it was really awesome. I could sit here and talk about all the memories that I had in there. Um, but I, it was this big plateaued area. There was like four or five different ways that you could get up a ramp. There was a jungle gym you could climb to get up. There was a rope you could climb. If you were good enough from the swing, you could jump up to it. It was incredible, but that wasn't the part that was awesome. There was actually a bridge, a wooden bridge that went up about 70 feet in my mind, um, went up real, real high to the, to this, the, the actual tree portion of it. And there was like a wraparound porch up there, right? So you could, you, this really awesome bridge, you'd walk up and then you'd walk around to the whole entire tree at the top. It was just so cool. I remember thinking how incredible it was. All, everybody from the neighborhood wanted to be there, but it was neat because I would see when my, when they were done building it, what'd they do? They sat back, right? They got chairs and they sat down and they were watching all the cousins and all the guys from the, the kids from the neighborhood come over and play, have fun, jumping off things we probably shouldn't have been jumping off, right? They, we, were, they, we were enjoying it. And that's, that's kind of like the image that I get here. The, the work was done for them. And now they just got to enjoy it. That's what Jesus is doing. He's seated at the right hand of God. The work has been done. All we have to do here is we have to believe and we have to dig deeper into his word. That's his, that's his encouragement for us. That's what Paul is praying for each and every one of us here tonight, that we would engage in a deeper relationship with the Lord, not surface, not, not just barely knowing, not getting enough to skip by, but really diving into the, to those thoughts and the revelations and the wisdom that you kind of have to chew on for a while, right? Those things that, aren't, that don't come to you right away. Maybe it's a couple days, maybe it's a week, maybe it's a month later that you're just like, 
Lord, what does this mean? You know, I can't get this through my brain. Um, that was that was the one about the riches for me that I read about. That that's we're his riches, man. I had to think about that for a couple days. Just hit me like crazy. So, um, in closing, what should we be known for? We should be known for faith in the Lord. We should know, be known for love for one another, right? Love for one another here at the church. And how will people know us? What does Scripture say? People will know us by our what? Anybody? Love. Nailed it. Right. He says they will know us by our love. And what should we di- be digging deeper into and asking the Spirit to reveal to us? Well, just a better relationship, a better knowing of who God is, a deeper meaning, a deeper relationship with God is what we should be doing, understanding the hope of each and every one of our callings, understanding that calling and putting hope and trust in that calling every day, the riches of his glory, of of his inheritance that we talked about, and the exceeding greatness of his power that we as believers share in. We share in that resurrecting power of Jesus Christ.